Well, for those of you who are here and online, you probably already heard Laurie say, come for the treats, <laughs> stay for the sermon. So, do you want these left up here for you? <laughs> There you go. So like little mini birthday cakes for baby Jesus. There we go. Just need some candles. Yeah. Exactly. Well, good morning, everyone. If you're joining us online, please, uh, if you haven't already, say hi. Let us know that you are watching. We would love to, to see who's all watching with us this morning. Wow. It's hard to believe we are on week three of Advent. You're literally two weeks from Christmas. It does not look like it outside. Yay. It doesn't, it hardly feels like it, but it's coming so close. And really the only true way to feel it is not the consumeristic way that we've all become accustomed to seeing our world in, but in this light of this sermon series we've been on, which is the Advent Conspiracy. So uh, week one, we talked about worshiping fully. And last week, uh, Pastor Mark gave us a message on spending less. And today we're going to hear about giving more. And, and as the outline says, it's more of our presence, more of our hands, more of our words, our time, and our heart. Think about that. I didn't see anywhere in there where it said give more money. Just like last week when we were talking about spending less, it wasn't about giving more gifts. It wasn't about doing that. There's a different heart when we think about what Advent is. And through this series, we're substituting consumption with compassion through these principles. So we invite you to uh, continue to join us uh, today and next week as we finish up with Love All. And if you have missed any of it, you can find it on our Facebook page or just simply go out to uh, gracestreet.church, click on the messages link, and the videos are all right there in, in order for you to watch. So we invite you to join us in catching up on that. The next thing that we have coming up in just under two weeks is the Christmas Eve candlelight service at 11 o'clock Christmas Eve. And uh, as you can see from the graphic for the last few weeks, Mark found this uh, perfect little motion video to put at the bottom of the candles flickering. Uh, so. That was awesome. So it is going to be beautiful in here. We've seen, we have seen what it looks like at night with just the, the string of yellow light, but with the trees and those of you online can't see it, but with the fireplace on over here and then with the candles that we'll have lit, it is going to be absolutely beautiful. So we invite you to join us for that. Uh, then jumping right into January, because Really, it's two weeks after Christmas. We will have our men next men's breakfast. This will be the third one. It'll be right here at Grace Street at nine o'clock. So we invite you to join us for that. And men, if you know someone who enjoy breakfast, because who doesn't enjoy food, but also some time of, of just fellowship. And when I talk about fellowship, I mean just people coming together and talking and we've got a devotional uh, mark's already got that queued up for us uh, for january so join us for that and then at some point in january probably in the probably around the third saturday i'm just guessing we will be having god's not dead we the people so looking forward to that um it's the fourth installment in the god's not dead series and then in quite shorter and you know our friend wade who loves orange track racing mm -hmm. wade has a countdown going on that he keeps posting on how many days until the next race <laughs> so we are uh, just about well the 11th we're two months out so is it for the race or the hot dogs i'm just curious it both <laughs> he loves his hot dogs oh, hot, hot dogs and and uh we, hot wheelies is what yeah. it says yeah. so we invite you to join for that and uh additionally for those of you watching online as far as the music is concerned uh we'll be posting a link in the the live stream to the playlist of the songs that we will be singing once the live is over to just call it a day. Yeah. 
calm down a little bit and put that all beside us and go to God. This morning our call to worship comes from John chapter 16 verse 33 where it says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. This is the third verse in, in a three verse piece where Jesus is explaining what's about to happen to the disciples. But this is the culmination, it's kind of the summary of all that he talked about that night, that no matter what happens, we're going to have peace. Now, you may have heard the phrase, all gave some, some gave all. But when we think about Jesus, there is no one who has given so much as he did. No one has given more than Jesus did. And we're going to face trouble. I mean, we can come into church and we can have a great day and um, a nice time of worship, but as soon as we leave that door, the world hits us smack dab in the face again. And we can have troubles. And part of that is sometimes we're out of sync. And I don't mean out of sync with the world, I mean we're out of sync with God. And Jesus is telling us when we get back in sync, you know, though there's many trials and many sorrows, we can have peace. And in a moment, Stephen and Denise are going to come up here and they're going to light the candle of peace this morning. A representation. So we will have, uh, week one was hope, and then last week, joy, and now this week, peace. Those things are not random. They go together. Jesus gave us the ultimate sacrifice. And we have the victory. But in having that victory, we need to remember that peace that we get through him. Jesus gave more than anyone else so that we can have a peace that no matter what happens, we can worship fully. And then we can truly understand what it means to spend less, give more, and love all. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to come here this morning and worship you. And when we talk about worship, Father, we have to remember that it this is not about us. Worship is about you. We may come here, Father, and, and have many things on our minds. We may have many troubles and sorrows and, and trials. But through you, Father, you give us peace. As we prepare to bring Pastor Mark up here to give us the message this morning, as a special blessing upon him, that his words would be yours. We thank you for all that he has done in preparing for this message, Father. And as Steve and Denise come up here to do the Advent candle lighting and reading this morning, Father, we thank you for them. We thank you that they have agreed to do that this morning. And we thank you for what these candles represent, the hope, the joy, and the peace. And certainly as next week comes, the love. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Today is the third Sunday in the season of Advent. In anticipation of the coming of Christ, each week we light another candle of our Advent wreath. This morning we light the third candle, and like the shepherds, we watch for signs of Messiah's birth. We celebrate the good news that was proclaimed for all people, saying glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Luke 2, 14. We reflect on the wonder of the manger, which represents God's rescue mission to come and save us, his beloved children. Today we celebrate the love that sent Jesus to be born in a humble manger. yesterday.
today, I had the honor and privilege of uh, being the officiant at a funeral for a friend that I've known for many, many years. And we were talking about the trials and the tribulations and, and the things that come against us in life and our life journey. And as we were talking about those things, uh, one of the things that popped into my head was our call to worship this morning. And I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And when we think about that, we really need to take that into heart. Because everything that we face, we have to understand that God is bigger than anything that we come across. We have to take that to God first, and then that peace will come upon us. So instead of battling out the battles as we go through, turn it over to God. He's bigger than any problem we face. And so I, I, I wanted to kind of kick that off today, because I was thinking about that when I was uh, preparing for the message this morning, and... and uh, I just thought about that, that in the midst of all the stuff going on, God is there. He's bigger than any of it. And we just need to go to God first. And then we can have that peace that we really want and we really long for in our lives, which just seems out of reach all the time. But really, truly, if we put God there, he hands us the peace because he's already overcome the in our Advent lighting and reading this morning, we go to Luke 2, 1 through 20. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. And this was the first census that was taken since Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all returned to their ancestral homes to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. And David's ancient home was there. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee, and he took Mary with him, his fiancée, who is now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to have the baby be born. And she gave birth to her first child. A son and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn as the traditional story goes the shepherds and angels that night were there with the sh shepherds staying in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, saying, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born in Bethlehem, the city of David. You will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to those to whom God is pleased. Then the angels had returned to heaven. The shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem, and let's see that this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. And it was just as the angel had told them. God sends his people among us that in the midst of things happening within the world, 
It's our wake-up call. It's our wake-up call. We need to listen for that voice. And I was talking about that uh, in my message last week when I said, you know, we, we have to take and listen to what God is saying. He gave us two ears and one mouth, and we should use them accordingly. Mm -hmm. So we need to listen twice as much as what we speak. And so when we think about that, we need to look and, and listen for the signs that God is sending amongst us. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So today we start our week three in our Advent Conspiracy Series, which is Give More. So when we think about giving more, how many of us reach immediately for our pocketbooks and whip out of that whole stack of $100 bills we got in there, right? <laughs> uh, maybe not so much. I got a lot of ones. <laughs> so it begs the question, why do people give? So as I was preparing for this message, I, I really was looking at this and because last week when I gave the message on spend less, I also talked to, I said, okay, I want you to spend less. And I spent 20 minutes talking about spending less. Mm -hmm. And then I said, now I want you to spend more. <laughs> and you know, the thing about it is, but we want to spend more time with our families, time with people. Mm -hmm. We spent a great time here last night uh, sharing food and a really fun game that we played and caroling and those kind of things and fellowshipping together bringing our hearts together mm -hmm. as family of God so we were spending that family we were giving of our time and our talents I mean wrapping up that saran wrap ball thing was that had to take some time <laughs> and talent I must say and it's first of all the little candy bar but in, in giving, we do that cheerfully. You know, we had people that made cornbread, and we had people that made chili and, and wild rice soup, which was really good. And, you know, we, we came together and shared that meal and shared our time. We gave of ourselves for others. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. So why do people give? People give when they know that their donations are going to make a difference in the life of other people. Okay? Point number two, people give to support causes that they find important. And this includes environmental preservation, health research, social equality, those kind of things. It's more of a, you know, a global give at that point in time. Some people give to support the fight against a particularly deadly disease, might be cancer or HIV, tuberculosis. We were, we were talking about last night the resurgence of polio that has come back. And so uh, doing the things that are necessary for us to uh, combat those dreadful diseases that are out there. Some people give because it makes them feel good, happy, satisfied. So. As I said last night, we, we cheerfully made food and shared it with each other and played games together and shared that with each other. We shared of our time and our talents and our gifts and we were being good stewards of what God has given us. And so we were able to share that as well. Some people give to reduce their income tax burden and we think about that, especially at this time of year, uh, while helping others while helping others so there's a lot of different reasons in the world today and this is kind of a secular view at giving why people give and so there's many reasons that might people might give of their time and their money their possessions but no matter the reasons it's important to remember that the act of giving helps both the giver of the gift or time or talent or resource and the receiver of that so it's kind of a double blessing that we get so as we give of these things we get a blessing in return so you get a return so it's kind of a double whammy it makes you feel good to give that out there and it makes you feel good to receive and see that blessing that you gave someone else and see if we think about it there's a stark difference 
as you can see, between just giving gifts and receiving them. And too often in society today, we, we look at that, we get up, caught up in all of the wish lists, you know, uh, all of the stress that the wish, wish lists bring. Oh, what if they don't like the present that I bought them? What if they, you know, what if it's not enough? What if it, you know, they're going to judge me. As I said last week, they're going to judge me six ways from Sunday if I didn't give them the right gift or spend enough. Or the dreaded one, well, you gave him more than you gave me. And it brings stress. And we get all caught up in what others can give us or what we have to, what we're obliged to give to someone else. And it takes all of that joy away. It takes the blessing away from the act of giving and of receiving. See, and that causes us to, you know, tense up, and it, it brings on actual health issues because of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get very, very uh, stressed out. Mm -hmm. But when you give freely and you give openly, mm -hmm. without all those expectations, when we put all those expectations aside, mm -hmm. guess what? It actually is healthy for us to be able to give. Mm -hmm. It actually is. So Abbott Pharmaceuticals did a study that showed it was better to give to others. Now, can you imagine that? A pharmaceutical company doing a study <laughs> on these things. I'm thinking they're going, okay, I've got a pill for this now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the next thing is, I'm going to give you a prescription. Mm -hmm. But they came up with seven benefits to giving. Number one, it activates the reward center in your brain. Makes you feel good. That's that dopamine effect that it comes through and, and says, oh, this feels really good. I'm giving to somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's that blessing returning to you. It improves life satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Wow. I went and did something for someone else mm -hmm. that was unselfish and I gave to someone else mm -hmm. and so therefore I have satisfaction in my life. Mm -hmm. Notice that stress level so far is just coming down. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes you happy. They found out it makes you happy. Mm -hmm. Number two, when you give freely and openly to others and you give willingly, guess what? It catches on and other people want to do the same thing. Has anybody ever seen that movie, Pay It Forward? Mm -hmm. Oh, we got to show that movie. We got to show that movie. It's all about a little boy. But I won't go into that today. Uh, but it's contagious. Mm -hmm. So he started a whole Pay It Forward movement. Mm -hmm. And they did, I'm sure you probably have heard about those kinds. You know, you buy the person in line behind you their breakfast or whatever happens yeah. to be their coffee, which is, you know, a huge gift in itself if you look at the prices at yeah. Starbucks yeah. Or, or, or Panera when you go there. Dodge <laughs> 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 uh, that bullet quick, didn't you? <laughs> but it improves your health, it reduces stress, and it increases self-esteem when we give to others. These are all points that they found out that if people freely and openly give without ob without all the obligations and without all the stress, guess what? It gives them health benefits. Mm -hmm. So why do we get it all caught up in that wish list kind of thing in there that brings on all the stress? Why do we get caught up in all of those things? Mm -hmm. Because it comes down to we're giving for the wrong reason. We're giving from obligation, not inspiration. So as I mentioned that last week, it really comes down to the marketing schemes. They're all driven by greed, the need to have more, you know, the empire of evil giving out there. So the reason for Christmas has been replaced by materialism and greed. And boy, I'll tell you what, you know, we... We sat down after we got home last night, and, and I was watching the commercials, and I was just going, man, you know, they, they just want you to buy stuff you, you have no use for. Mm -hmm. This light up shaky thing, I still haven't figured out. <laughs> I've, I've watched that commercial purposely now, trying to figure out what it is and what it's for. And I find no reason to have it whatsoever. So. When we take a look at these things then, and we, we look at why they're trying to force us or, or coax us into buying, it's not 
to help someone else out. It's not to fulfill a need, it's to fulfill greed. So the Christian perspective has gotten lost in the process of free and openly giving of gifts to help another person and then getting the blessings in return. That's the Christian perspective on giving. So as a result of that, many of us struggle to find the connection between our Christmas wish list and the story of Jesus' birth, the story of that one gift that was given to us. That is better than any gift could ever be given in eternity. And to be totally honest, when we look at that and we're trying to find that Christmas wish list and we're trying to tie that back into the reason for the season, guess what? There really is none. There's no tie-in anymore. That whole perspective is gone. It's all about the wants and wishes, but really our needs, our needs seem to take a back seat to those two items. So Paul quotes Jesus in Acts, and he says it's more blessed to give than to receive in Acts 20, 35. So if we press ourselves, I mean really press ourselves, we generally believe that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I think we do generally believe that. Or at least we think we do. We think we do. We struggle with believing that giving is better than getting, and why wouldn't we? Because acquiring and hoarding and those kind of things are part of our broken culture that we live in every day. So we live in that world of that broken culture. We, we live in the fact that you know, we got to acquire whatever we can. We got to keep up with the Joneses. We got to do all these things to make ourselves look better. Look better. Looks can be very deceiving. Mm -hmm. Even some Christians go to God in prayer, and it seems like it becomes more of a wish list and less about worship. It's carried over into their prayer life, and they, they come to God and they, they, they just heap on this wish list. God, I, I want this, and I want that, and I want this, and I want that. And it becomes less about God and more about what we want, not what we need. We need to be more intentional, more focused when it comes to our prayers in God. Because when we start there, everything else then will trickle down. That's about me. So when we look to God, he's more concerned about our needs and not our wishes. He grants our needs when we present them earnestly and not necessarily our wants or our wishes. We can come to him with our whole Christmas list of everything that we want. Oh God, give me this. Oh God, if I only had a bigger house. Oh God, if I only had a new car and, you know... That's not worship. We go to God to worship God in prayer. Not to give him our Santa Claus list. He's not Santa Claus. We have to look at what God wants out of that conversation, out of that relationship. He doesn't want to have us come to him and just say, I want, I want, I want. But if he say, God, I need this for my life we come to him earnestly, then he will honor our prayers, scriptures tell us. So last week I talked about our time and being intentional about how we spend it, being meaningful in spending our time where the effects of that will last. Uh, because our time is finite, meaning once it's gone, it can never be regained. Once that time is gone, we can't get it back. We can't go down to Walmart and flip them five bucks at the, you know, automatic checkout counter. Mm -hmm. Technically, at that point in time, do we even become employees of Walmart? Because, you know, we're doing the checkout. I haven't had to do a W-2 yet. Well, that's true. So, <laughs> anyway, we can't go down there and just simply buy time. There's no such thing as being able to buy time. Once the time is gone, it can't be regained. 
we need to understand fully how important this is in our lives because once it's gone, it means it's gone, it's finite, it's done. And I talked about this at the funeral yesterday in, in the message that I was giving them. And uh, I mentioned it last night in one of the songs that I played. And, you know, it talks about, there's two different talks, songs that we played yesterday. And it talks about if I only had one more chance, if I only had that one more time, that one more minute, if I only had that back, mm -hmm. that wasted time that we weren't able to spend with that loved one, what would you say? What would you do? Time is finite, and we need to be using our time wisely. The things we give our time to that is critical to living that fulfilled life that I talked about last week. God is calling us to give more intentionally and relationally. Meaning, we want to give our time, like we did last night. We want to give our time to each other in here, to be able to share that. Mm -hmm. What happened last night? Did you notice? As we were, one of these two is going to drive me crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, as we were sitting here last night, what, what happened? All of the stress, all of the problems that we had for the week. And mm -hmm. last week was a pretty bad week, if you ask me. Because mm -hmm. it was filled with stress all the time and we had a lot going on there were several deaths that happened last week and so we had a lot of grief going on at the same time and we came and we gathered together here as our church family our church family brothers and sisters in christ what happened to all the stress what happened to that we were unwrapping that ball and candy and and the little things came out do you understand what that did? Yeah. That brought us together. That unified us together. Mm -hmm. We spent quality time. And the stresses of the world mm -hmm. went away. Mm -hmm. Just for that short amount of time. If nothing more. Mm -hmm. And we were fulfilled and blessed to be in each other's company. Mm -hmm. So God is calling us to give more intentionally and relationally. And that's what it means. It means giving more of our time, our energy, our memories, our talents, and our presence to things that matter and that will be long-lasting. When we come to this understanding, then, it becomes both an and proposition. Spend less money and give more of yourself to the ones you love. It's a both an and. So when we do that, it sounds obvious, yet we had seemed to have drifted away from this, you know, straightforward truth. And we tend to get caught up in the stuff of the world. And nothing brings the point home better, I, I hate to say that, sitting in a funeral. Because at that point in time, we, we understand the finite time that we have. We understand our own mortality and what that means. So when we do, we need, we need to take a look at that. We need to look at giving and gifts, our time, our energy, our money. When we take a look at what God has given us with our lives, the people that he's brought into our lives are gifts. The Father gave his one and only Son, Jesus Christ, as a gift to us of pure love your love. God's answer for the world's problems has never been in material things. If you're having a problem, all of a sudden out here, will a brand new, you know, Tesla pop up in the parking lot for us? No. God doesn't give it to us in material things. He doesn't give us more stuff. Even good stuff like work or food or health. He gave of himself in Jesus. He gave of that everlasting gift, the one that lasts for eternity. He gave us his son so that we could have life in him eternally. And that's the most priceless and personal gift of all. When we give relationally during the Advent season, this is what we remember. It's an opportunity to worship. And we remind each other of the gift 
that was given for our sake. That is the reason for the season. That's what Christmas is all about. It's not about Santa Claus. Sorry. It's not about Christmas trees and fancy decorations. It's not about any of that stuff. And presents and fancy wrapping. It's about the gift that God gave us that lasts a lifetime. Eternal lifetime. So once again, this week, we're going to jump into that Wayback Machine. And yeah, I got the graphic for it this time. I actually went and looked it up. It's, it's Simon and Mr. Peabody. I almost called him Dr. Peabody. Because yeah. Mr. Peabody. So what I want you to do is I want you to go back. And I want you to think... What was the most meaningful gift that you've ever received? And we kind of talked about that a little bit last night. And I thought it was great because, uh, you know, the one answer that was given last night was, best gift I ever received was time with family. The best memory from back then was time with family, time well spent. And I talked about that last week. I couldn't remember a time when I was given a gift as a kid, what I remember is, I remember that time when we, when we had my great grandparents' house and had a spiral staircase that came downstairs. Mm -hmm. And we used to slide down there. I get reminded of that because it was a really fun time for us kids, but the parents, <laughs> on the other hand, didn't really quite think so. Great grandparents yeah. really didn't think so. Yeah. But it's a memory that you build. And it stays with you, last, it lasts through the lifetime. So question number two, in what areas of your life do you long to experience Emmanuel? God with us. It should be, hopefully, daily. You want to experience that God, that God experience each and every day. When it comes to your past, what is the best memory you have of Christmas? Was it more materialistic things or was it relational was it family time was it church was it going out sledding and I think uh, the illustration I used last week was we went out sledding we came back in and had hot cocoa and chili and all of the fixings that went along with us and we watched a brand new movie that was how the Grinch stole Christmas I can remember that vividly I can almost smell the smells that we had when we got all together there and because uh, we had this huge 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 fresh Christmas tree in there and man oh, it was fragrant it was it was great but it was the relational stuff not the stuff stuff that you remember now that goes all the way back to 1966 so so when we think about it you know do you concentrate and focus more on material stuff or relational, those memories that can build. When it comes to giving relationally, how does it make you feel? And when you give relationally, how do you think it makes others feel? When we're able to bless someone with a piece of furniture that they didn't have before, or clothing, or something like that, that they truly need. When we're fulfilling a need and we're giving relationally, it brings a higher level of blessing back. Some people feel joy and peace as they do that. And last week I talked about the joy it brings when we go out and go caroling and we try and make a joyful noise when we sing. But regardless of how we sound, it's more about the memories that we bring back to those who hear and sing it with us. And then that instills that joy and brings a sense of peace along with it. Now, unfortunately, last night we weren't able to go out and get all the connections made, but still in all, when we think back on those things, those are the things that last. So peace, peace. That's a word that gets thrown a lot around this time of year. We kind of tend to focus on peace a lot. And it's a concept that often refers to tranquility or a sense of calm. Mm -hmm. The English definition of the word peace is free from disturbance. And I like that one. That's why I wanted to pull that up. Free from disturbance. Now, 
When we think about that, what is the first thing that pops into your mind? Free from disturbance. Chaos and craziness, right? Kind of that tranquil place where you can just kind of, especially after you come home from a long day of work, putting up with those ultra, ultra sane people that you work with, and you come home and you go, boom, right? You just kind of drop. You're done with the chaos of the day. You want that freedom from the disturbances, the things that interrupt our lives. And yet in, in the Bible, Jesus talks about having peace in the midst of turmoil. Right in the middle of that chaos, we can have peace in that turmoil or the problems that we face. When we look at cultural Christmas and the holiday season, it's been very stressful and chaotic because of the pressures to try and satisfy everyone to the point to where there is no longer peace. There is no longer joy. There is no longer peace in giving someone something. There's no more joy in the giving. There's no more blessing that gets returned because, you know, it's just an obligation we have to fulfill. Who in here likes to have to fill obligations? Not many people do, right? So then the question comes, how do we experience something that is free to, from disturbance when we're actually bothered by the circumstances in our life? How do we get that peace? How do we get that freedom when we're bothered by the circumstances in our life? Understanding this is being brought by the choices that we make. In other words, we tend to create our own chaos, so how are we going to be free from the chaos that we create ourselves? It's cyclical. It's like that catch-22 situation. You, never, you, you can never get out of it. The only way to do that is to go to a source of peace first. We have to submit ourselves to God. And when we do that, he will bring us the peace that we seek. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to what Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, 33. I have told you all this so that you might have peace mm -hmm. in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials mm -hmm. and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. This is exactly what he's talking about. When we're so caught up in the and the chaos and the trials and the problems, a lot of times they're created by the choices we make. He says, hey, I told all you guys, you don't have to do that. Come to me and I will give you that peace. I will give you that understanding. I will give you the peace and the hope and the love that surpasses all. When we look at scripture, it's important to know the context of that conversation. Jesus had just explained that he is returning to the Father and sending the Holy Spirit. He knew he was sacrificing his life. He was giving the ultimate gift. And so he had told his disciples all of these things that was going to come to pass. Now, depending upon how you look at that situation, he knew he was going to go and he was going to have to bear the cross. He was going to have to give his own life. And so he told his disciples ahead of time, I have told you all these things. You're going to have many trials. People are going to come against you. You're going to turn against me. You're going to deny that you know me. And he says, but I'm telling you all these things ahead of time so that you know that you will still have peace in me. Here on earth, you're going to have those trials, but take heart because I have overcome the world. In other words, don't get caught up in all the stuff of the world. Don't, don't let that rule your lives because I've already overcome it for you. I have given my life for you so that you can have peace in me. So he knew his followers that they're going to mourn over what was going to happen to him. 
as the remainder of the world rejoices with the perceived destruction of Jesus and his ministry. See, they thought the Pharisees and all the chief priests and those who were against Jesus, they thought it was all over once he was hung on the cross. But see, as I said yesterday in the, in the sermon, see, that was the beginning. That wasn't the end of the story. It was the beginning of the story. They missed the point. Jesus acknowledges that the pain that his followers will experience, and yet he still tells them to have peace in him. How are they to have tranquility in such a moment like that? How, how can the people who were attending that funeral yesterday have peace within their spirits? Because we have to explain to them, it's not the end. It's the beginning of the journey. And the tranquility comes because of the legacy that was left. The love, the memories, those things that they had, that they will have with them for the rest of their lives. doesn't go away. It's a gift. The word peace that Jesus uses in his conversation with the disciples in Hebrew, the word is shalom. And shalom means a wholeness or a completeness. And so Jesus is telling his disciples that, yeah, your world seems shattered, but you're going to have this wholeness. You're going to have a completeness in me. And I'm telling you this so that you won't have to go through all of the struggles. You can have peace in me. You can have that wholeness, that completeness. And he became the unblemished sacrifice for all of us for our sins. That sacrifice in and of itself is the gift that negates all of the world's view of giving. And then that gift, we receive peace and we receive joy. And we know and love at that point in time that is everlasting. In his book, Near Christianity, C.S. Lewis writes, God cannot give us peace and happiness apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. I'm going to read that again. God cannot give us a happiness and a peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. There is no true peace outside of God. So when we're looking for that freedom from the disturbances of the world, we can't find true peace without God. God has to be at the center of it. So I started off this morning by talking about how we need to submit it, how we need to give it to God first, and then he'll give us that peace. He'll give us those things. We have to invite him in first. We can't go screaming to God later on, God, why, why'd, you, why'd you let this happen to me? And his answer to you is, because you didn't invite me in to start with. And that should be a, a virtual slap in the face to us. Wake up call. Bring God in at the start. And guess what? The ending is going to be quite different. Mm -hmm. So let's look at what the scripture says about the peace of the Lord. Romans 5, 1 through 5 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith. Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into the problems and trials. For you know that they help us to build endurance. It allows us to go through the storm. To weather the storm. It strengthens our character and gives us that confidence in the hope of salvation. God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. And see, it's not fleeting. It's not a gift that's here today and gone tomorrow. That gift is a gift through our faith. God gives us that gift, instills it in our heart. It's with us all the time. We have to remember that. We tend to lose sight of those things. This is the assurance we get from God through his word and an assurance that the 
that the world is needing and searching for that can only be found through the gift of Jesus. The people out in the world are, today are just searching for an answer. They're searching for something bigger and better, something to fulfill their lives. And the thing about it is, it's right in front of their face. God gave it to them already. They have to accept it. They have to accept it. God gives the gift to anyone who accepts Jesus as their Savior. God opened the door to unite all peoples through Christ. We see that in the letter of Paul to the Ephesians in 2, 2 13 through 16. But now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between the Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people. One new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death by doing so. And what came forth from that is shalom, peace, wholeness, completeness. Notice this wasn't done by forceful means. This was done through love, a self-sacrificing gift to bring peace to all men. So he reminds us, above all, clothe yourselves in love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to live a life of faith that is devoted to you. We want to have a heart that pursues you before anything else. And you said, if we seek you with all our heart, we will find you. Help us to keep our focus on you and your will. Align your will with ours and help us to keep your commands. Lord, we want to live a life of obedience and faithfulness to you. Help us not in to fall into that temptation and sin. Forgive us for the times we have stumbled. We thank you for your forgiveness and love. We want to change and live by your way, Lord. Mm -hmm. You are merciful, and we know that you will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. And I pray that you would provide a way out for us whenever we face those temptations and the courage to turn away from the things that would separate us from you. And whatever temptation and sin knock at the door, Lord, help us to focus instead on your goodness and your love so that we can resist and overcome them. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray for strength whenever we face difficulties and times that would overwhelm us. Turn us to you, Lord. Let us find that peace that you have promised us. Mm -hmm. We lift each and every worry and burden to you because we know that you're greater than anything that we may face. And remind us daily that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. May we gain strength from doing the things that bring you joy. But we pray to live a life of a disciple. And, how, and Lord, overall, teach us how to be a good steward and guard the hours and minutes that you've entrusted to us. So that we can use our time wisely. We pray that the desires of our hearts will be aligned with yours. So we can shed our unhealthy habits. Thank you for being our strength, our protection, our provider. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray today.
this meal represents this whole message today. On the night that he was betrayed, and this John 16.33 that Mark picked for the call to worship this morning, this is, this is where we're at in this story. For on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Matthew records it this way. He says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it, for this is my body. And then a little later in the meal, he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. And he finishes by saying, mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. I invite each of you to come up and enjoy. Join us in communion this morning. I invite you up here to share with us the prayers and the praises for the people this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it was so great to be here last night. We had such a good time with everyone. So now it's time for prayers for the people. And uh, we're going to pray for the Kelly family and um, for those that have lost their lives this week, and uh, is there any other prayers that we would ask for? Just pray for Mark's dad isn't feeling very well in the interview, yeah. so just to okay. lift him up for some comfort. Okay, we'll do that. And peace. Okay. Becky will be moving sometime in the next week to her new home. So praise for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it all goes well. Okay. <clears throat> so I thank you, Father God, for Grace Street Church, for the people you have chosen to fellowship together. I thank you for the people we are reaching online and in church every Sunday. We are truly blessed by the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in this place. You are a great God and so worthy of praise and honor. You are faithful when we are not. You meet us right where we are. There is no place we can run that you cannot find us. Even in our darkest hour, you are there to guide us and direct us back to the paths of righteousness for your namesake. You will restore our souls if, uh, if we repent and ask for forgiveness. For Romans 14, 9 says, For this very reason Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. So, Father God, we just lift up Harold this morning. We just ask for comfort and peace and of mind. And just be with him. He's walked with you his whole life, Lord Jesus. So just comfort him in his trials now, Lord Jesus. And lift his spirits as only you can. 
And we just asked for um, help for Becky and a praise for her new living space for her children and uh, grandchildren. And we just thank you, Jesus, that you have provided all of this for her. And we pray that she will have a um, easy time transitioning into her new home. And just bless this new home and be with them in their new home so that they will worship and honor you, Lord God. And as we praise you this morning, Father God, we ask for healing for the families that have lost loved ones this week. I pray for the Kelly family, that you will be in the midst of this family and, gui and guidance and giving wisdom on how to proceed with the estate. I pray for peace and comfort and healing among the family members, restored relationships, that they will live in peace with one another as their hearts heal from the loss of their husband and father. I pray for the families of lost ones that have intentionally ended their lives too soon. I pray for guidance and healing of heart. hearts, Lord. Help, the, help these family members seek you in the midst of their heartache so they might find healing for their mental pain and suffering, Lord God. Lord Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to you except through you. So we praise you and honor you this morning, giving you glory and honor in all things. I pray you will guide Doug to the knowledge of the plans that you have for his future. Whether um, being a missionary here in Iowa or in Texas or anywhere else, let you be his guiding light to help him know the path you have laid out for him. Walk with him and talk with him and help him to follow you wherever he goes and to help lead others to you, Lord Jesus, for you are the reason why we are here. I pray Romans 15, 13 over all who are here and online. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for your unfailing love for all of us. We praise you and we thank you and honor you for all things, great and small. So as we close out our online portion of our service today, uh, I do invite you to uh, play the music. Uh, go look up the scripts and, and play the playlist that we have for you here, if you're not here, to enjoy it with us as we join together in these songs. Uh, I think the songs today will have a special meaning mm -hmm. um, if you listen to them with an open heart today. So receive this benediction. God, grant to the living grace and to the departed rest, to the nation peace and harmony to us all. God, grant to us your servants the promise of everlasting life, a light to guide us on our way, courage to support each other in grace and in mercy and in love. And Lord, we ask your blessing to unite us in service to you, our God, and to this church, your family that we have here today. Let us go forth into the world in peace, hope, and love, wholly dedicated to your service, O Lord, and let us hold fast to that which is good, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the needy and the afflicted, and Lord, bring honor to all people. Let us serve the Lord with love, rejoicing in the power of his spirit. And may God's blessing be upon us and remain with us always. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray today. 